second panel on market risk and I would like to introduce the eminent panelists and request them to come on stage. The first panelist is Ms. Jaina Gandhi. Uh, Ms. Gandhi has around 18 years of experience in the areas of finance and fixed income treasury management. Apart from this, she is an active volunteer with the Indian Association of Investment Professionals, a member society of the CFA Institute USA, and a visiting faculty for various MDP programs by the NISM. Ms. Jaina Gandhi. Mr. Navneet Munod, Chief Investment Officer, SBI Fund Management. Mr. Munod has over 20 years of experience in financial markets. He is the Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer of SBI Funds Management Private Limited. As the CIO, he is responsible for overseeing assets of over rupees 72,000 crores across various asset classes. <laughs> Mr. Vedanathan Krishnaswamy, Faculty, ISB and University of Connecticut. Mr. Krishnaswamy is a resident in faculty at the Indian School of Business, Mohali. Prior to joining ISB, he was an assistant professor in residence at the School of Business, University of Connecticut, and continues to hold a visiting faculty position there. He was an investment banker with J.P. Morgan Chase in Hong Kong, New York, and Singapore, and has advised financial institutions and corporates in the Asia-Pacific region on hedging and risk management. Mr. Vedanathan Krishnaswamy. Mr. Vikram Bhoravad. Director in Head Market Risk Management, Deutsche Bank. Mr. Moravat has over 15 years of relevant risk experience and has worked in leading banks like Credit Suisse, Citibank, HSBC, and ICICI Bank across functions. He is responsible for global market risk reporting, market data, and is involved in related market risk strategic projects. I welcome the panelists and would request Mr. Vedanathan Krishnaswamy to please moderate the discussion. Um, first of all, a very good evening to all of you. Um, thanks to Marticus to, uh, for inviting me for this, this panel. Um, the tone for this panel has already been set uh, by the panel before. Uh, um, so, and it's, it's, it's a very interesting and very pertinent topic, uh, talking about market risk. So, let me just you know, uh, give some opening remarks and then open, go for the discussion to the panel. Uh, so, firstly, uh, post financial crisis uh, 2008, okay, market risk has changed uh, dramatically. So, this was one of the uh, the the only crises. If you look back, you know, Argentina, Mexico, Russia, and so on. Uh, this, this is perhaps the, the first crisis where you had the origins of the crisis in credit risk, as in you know you had subprime loans, uh, but the ramifications of that were felt in the markets, in financial markets. So, you know, just to give an example, uh, something like a trillion dollars of loans, uh, subprime loans, uh, uh, you know, less, you know, uh, the entire subprime loan market is about a trillion dollar, uh, give or take uh, 100, 100 billion dollars. But then what you actually saw were institutions collapsing and the Fed bailing out, um, you know, firms like, uh, you know, AIG, Lehman Brothers collapsing and so on. So you, you had uh, the origins of the crisis were in market risk, and you know they had huge ramifications in financial markets. So we, you know, uh, so so clearly, uh, market risk has become a lot more complicated, and also you also see interlinkages between different risks. Secondly, as uh, as um, as I think uh, Mr. Lokrat Mishra mentioned, uh, way back in 2004, if you look look at the Indian context. Uh, way back in, you know, about 10 years back, if you look at walls of dollar rupee, you know, I used to trade FX options with, with Morgan, the walls used to be like 2 or 3% implied walls, okay? Now, walls are hovering around 12%. So you clearly, you know, market beat FX markets, these commodity markets, uh, clearly uh, markets have become extremely volatile. Um, and, and you see that in the equity markets as well. So, um, so, we, so we'll talk about, you know, uh, market risk in the global context as also in the Indian context. And uh, let me open the panel by, uh, by just, you know, uh, to Jaya and I, I hope, you know, I, I think she heads the treasury for NSE, and uh, specifically she looks after the, uh, the fixed income part, right? Yeah. So, uh, 
So, I mean, if you, if you, if you look at the, the fixed income uh, heading instruments, I think, you know, one of the latest uh, uh, instruments that's got introduced is the interest rate futures. You have about, about 3,000 to 5,000 crores volumes every, every day. Uh, but, but then the, the, the market hasn't really taken off as well as you probably would have liked to because we have an extremely very robust government bond market. If you look at all of Asia, you know, India has, I mean, except Japan, India has by far one of the very, very extremely good sovereign debt markets. You know, we have a fairly good uh, corporate bond market as well. Compared to countries like China or Malaysia or even Singapore and Hong Kong, we have a very robust domestic uh, bond market. So I just wanted to ask you this, that, you know, um, what is it that, you know, uh, exchanges like the NSC and even perhaps the RBI, what innovations could they perhaps do or what, what, what could they do differently to be able to allow market participants more tools to be able to manage market risk better? Uh, in terms of uh, NSC and RBI loan, they have recently introduced the 5-year and 13-year contracts on the interest rate futures segment in addition to the 10-year. So the contract uh, maturity, uh, across the various maturity, like five, earlier uh, only it was only 10 year maturity, wherein you could help your portfolio market risk in terms of interest rate risk if you are facing in terms of, uh, if you have a uh, long bond portfolio, you can come and short in the uh, interest rate futures market, but only the 10 year bond was allowed. Recently, RBI has allowed uh, five year and 13 year maturity bond. So uh, in terms of that, now the you can even uh, when there is a duration match mismatch, so uh, the five and thirteen year securities in addition to ten year securities are available, and uh, we have uh, it has been launched last week only, and we have been, uh, we have seen the encouraging volume on the seven and year two thousand thirty securities on this. So I think the market is catching up on this aspect. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, and, and let me now turn to Vikram perhaps uh, 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 and, and ask you about, uh, because you, you kind of, you know, uh, do the entire market risk for Deutsche Bank and uh, have a good, very good perspective in terms of, you know, uh, where market risk modeling and analytics is heading. Um, and if I recall, uh, Deutsche Bank, I think, is moving from, uh, from, from you know, traditionally it's been doing Monte Carlo simulations and that's how you would model the market risk and now it's moving on to historical simulations. And, and just to give you context, uh, all American banks do it uh, using historical beat, you know, Morgan or Morgan Stanley or Goldman or Citi. Uh, and there's also a lot been happening in this new set of regulations called as the FRTB, uh, uh, the Financial the Fundamental Review of, of Trading Book, which is now part of Basel III. So, uh, so, so Vikram, uh, I mean, what do you think are the challenges for? I'm not so concerned about the Deutsche banks and the you know the, the global banks. You know they will they will get there. But what about the the, the Lloyd's bank? I mean the, small, the smaller banks, which are based on the Lasalle banks. You know which are the, the smaller banks, which perhaps don't have the bandwidth to be able to you know uh, be able to model market risk the way the the, the Basel company now wants them to model under the FRTB guidelines. What might be the challenges there? I think one of the key things, you know, I think I have to go back in terms of what, obviously why, what the global banks are doing and even they are learning through the process. It's not that, okay, everything is done, me. why you want to move from Monte Carlo? So there's a background to it, like in FRTB, uh, you know, uh, like in India as well, we use like 10 day regulatory bar or we use a PDP basis approach. But eventually what's happening with FRTB and 2007 crisis, we are changing that liquidity horizon from different asset classes have a different point. You know, credit have 180 days. That means you're holding that holding period goes to 180 days. And if I'm using a Monte Carlo, it becomes very difficult to model. And also in terms of uh, even we have to do full reval now because as we go to the bigger banks, I think you know the full revaluation is very very important. Okay, so I think those are the you know key challenges as far as the big banks are concerned, really, because we sit with a lot of exotic assets and eventually to pull reval, you will take a lot of time eventually to really uh, cover with those numbers. If actually I go to the more the smaller banks, I think as far as FRTP is concerned, firstly, they will need to move to in the current framework, they will need to move more into the, you know, get the historical simulation, get the infrastructure in terms of getting that market data for seven, eight years, you know, which is a very robust market data. 
eventually because the key for key basis for any of this market uh, models or analytics is going to be the market data and the market trends. Somebody asked a question on liquidity release that if you don't have like a bid ask spread, what you will do? Eventually, we will need to proxy. If it's not available, we will eventually need to proxy, and that proxy has to have a lot of governance around it, and that governance has to be even validated and proven that okay, yes, it's a very robust and uh, and and basically regulators has to accept it. Okay. So from a smaller bank perspective, uh, I see like you know DPS Bank was moved into a strong simulation. It was relatively very smaller bank. I think they didn't have they didn't had a very big challenge. Assuming that they were more in Asia, market data was there. Fully aware well was not very difficult. But I think there's more challenge in terms of uh, the larger banks in terms of analytics side. And uh, one of the key other thing is even today, uh, war is not considered as complete. You need to do stress testing. You will need to do uh, I think somebody mentioned risk appetite. So you really need to be more forward looking. It's not about historical analysis. So you need to do stress testing and uh, eventually uh, full data. So there's a lot of dynamics which are being added and uh, even regulators do not trust the models as it is. You need to even validate them. So I think that become a huge challenge and you will see in India becoming a market risk. All the banks are really expanding their market risk, especially the foreign banks and really building the resource pool here to really validate those kind of complex models and eventually uh, move towards more standardization. So we're moving away from a complex models to more standardized approach. So even FRTP is all about that. You know, you have to calculate your models not only on the basis of complex models, but also the standardized of models. And then you combine, which is the first, or you know, take the combination and then calculate your capital. Uh, thanks, Vikram. Yeah, so I mean, pretty difficult in terms of to be able to. Now you have to calculate capital in terms of value at risk, and then you have stress value at risk, and you have something called as incremental risk charge. So, you know, uh, a lot of uh, heavy duty modeling stuff to be able to calculate your capital for market risk. Uh, let me now uh, turn over to Navneet. Uh, you know, he's the CIO for, for SBI Mutual Fund. Uh, you know, there's this lot, lot of this talk about how Indian markets have got increasingly integrated with the rest of the world. I mean, so for instance, a week back, uh, it, let's say the Fed cut interest rates or, you know, um, I mean, there was no quantitative easing then, but, you know, if there, any monetary policy changes by the Fed wouldn't have much of an effect in equity markets over here in India. But now things have changed, I mean, especially post-crisis. So, uh, what do you think? Yeah, perhaps the challenges for for a, for a CIO in, in the Indian context from you know what's happening elsewhere. Uh, you see a lot of you know risks being getting carried over globally to to the Indian markets and you know the markets being more uh, joined uh, at the groups perhaps. You just use the word heavy duty risk models if I remember correctly and I'll, I'll try to avoid any of this jargon here because my ex boss Mr. Mitra is sitting here and I remember in our investment committee we used to use one liner uh, several times when analysts predict God laughs and I mean at the end of their models are our, our models. Uh, on a more serious note in terms of the linkages with the, with the global markets you are absolutely right so we live in a world which is hyper-connected. We live in a world where markets are extremely linked with each other. So uh, money market, bond market, currency, commodities, equities, they all impact each other and all markets are, are hyper-linked. Money moves at the speed of thought and every event anywhere in the, in the world affects us. And particularly over the last several years we've been, I keep saying that our Indian markets have been dancing to the tune of global liquidity, global risk appetite, global uh, you know, the, uh, interest rate cycle. And the simple reason is that the dependence on the external capital flows to fund our current account has been so much for the last several years. So I use one chart where if you put the Nifty and German DAX on one single chart, definitely, I mean, the, direct, I mean, the uh, magnitude would be different, but in terms of the sheer direction, and put that chart for the last 15 years from 2002 to 2015, and you'll be amazed seeing the, how, how these two lines move so much together. And both these countries have very different economic, business, political cycles, completely different. But still for the simple reason that wherever the risk appetite goes up for a global investor, India is a high beta risk market. I mean, this is a definitely a 
very good high beta market and, and, and relative to most of the other risk assets, high beta markets, the moving money in and out has been relatively far easier. So whenever risk appetite is high, a lot of money moves in. Anything happens, any part of the world, like Greece or China or anywhere, the money moves out and then impacts us it's very dramatically. I remember in 2007, all asset managers or all the people selling the entire story we used to work, we used to use one word called decoupling. So there may be a subprime crisis in the US, but how it is going to affect us? Let's bear a stand in, in March 2008 has fallen, but how does it going to affect India? India is likely to grow at 9% for next several years and will do well, but unfortunately we fell 60% in 2008, calendar year 2008, much more than several other markets in the world for simple reason that. I know one change at the margin which is happening, one is that I think for a period of time, the events that have happened in China and the structural reason, without going too much into the uh, macro, but I think the institutional credibility of India is likely to improve substantially within the overall emerging market set. So I, I think a structural money flow to, towards India, both in the bond and equity, as bond markets get higher access uh, from the foreign investors. I mean, the, the, the regulators allow more access to the global investors is going to increase substantially. But more importantly, I think as as we have a more financialization of, of our retired savings, so more savings, the saving rate goes up for a variety of reasons, and then as more savings come to the financial markets, particularly the equity and bond market, and there are clear signs over the last 14 and 15 months that more and more domestic investors, for two reasons, I mean for the conviction that India is likely to do well over the next several years and the markets are likely to deliver good returns, as well as a compulsion that the other asset classes are unlikely to do well. So I think equity relatively looks far better than real estate gold, most of the other places where people were putting money. I think that can reduce the vulnerability to the global capital flows to some extent. But I think as I mentioned in, in the beginning, so I'm, I'm sure that in the last couple of weeks, you can clearly see the resilience in, in, in the dollar rupee. You can clearly see the equity market and the bond market. We were the least volatile bond market, by the way last two months, the kind of volatility global bond market has seen. Look at the emerging market currencies, look at the emerging market uh, equities. I, I think India has shown a tremendous resilience, which I think is, is hugely structural in nature. But as a technical investor, I, I think one would always be worried about because we live in a world which is like extremely uh, Thanks, Anik. And let me just follow up that with a, with, with, with a question uh, on, on what you mentioned. Uh, now, you actually find that the U.S. did three rounds of quantitative easing. The ECB is now doing quantitative easing, and you have the Bank of Japan also doing uh, pretty a lot of yen. Uh, how much of, so you have a lot of liquidity floating around in the global system. Now, how much of that is actually affecting Indian markets? Of course, I, I think the overall return expectations for all asset classes <laughs> would have gone down, obviously, because you're, uh, I mean, the when you keep the overnight rate at 0% and when you give this comfort to the market that we are not going to be disruptive, we'll keep, when, when, when last central bank governors tell you, we'll do whatever it takes. And, and, and I think there, there is an implicit put option written by the, the right from the Fed to BOE, BOJ, ECB, PBOC, almost all central banks that we are there, don't worry, go and, I mean, you know, short volatility, go and they, they, they just go along with any asset class because we, 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 we are there, of course. I think I, it will be too much to expect that central bankers can remain the way they have been over the last several years. At some point in time, there would be risk. But I think at least in the foreseeable future, this liquidity situation, I, I think we live in a world where this whole excess savings, I mean, we, we, we live in a world with a savings glut where I think the overall savings is going to be far in excess of the investment needs, and that's why I think the overall return expectations from almost all the asset classes have to be far lower than what you have realized over the last several decades. And I don't see it changing very dramatically. You can clearly see the U.S. Fed in the last several months that the way they are trying to prepare the market for a 25 or 50 basis point rate high because they don't want it to be disruptive with the, you know, the whole taper tantrum that happened in 2015. So I think this whole put option which is written and make a, what is that? Why the sun shines? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it seems, uh, I mean, in not just savings, I mean, just that even the corporates have flush with funds. I mean, if you look at an Apple or a Microsoft, they have like $200 billion sitting on cash. I mean, so a lot of corporates in the U.S., uh, be it in Europe, you know, have, have, there's a lot of liquidity floating around uh, in, the, in, the, in the global monetary system. So coming back to India, uh, 
Jana, you manage you know fixed income portfolios, um, and 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 one of the one of the you know fancy trades that are now you know seen the in the OTC market, in the banking market, are these you know quantoed stuff, you know quantoed into into rupees in other currencies because India interest rates are fairly high. Um, do you think that you know uh, given interest rates are so high globally, you know interest rates are are fairly low, almost zero, and, and, and somewhere negative. For example, Switzerland is negative, Denmark is negative, and so on. So, what are your thoughts on you know uh, on two interesting things? Interest rates being negative was unfor. I mean, I'm now I'm now an academic, and it's almost you know uh, very very difficult for academics to kind of you know reconcile the fact that you know uh, interest rates can be negative because a lot of you know your financial theories go for a toss. Now, but be, be, be that be that as it may. Uh, First of all, what do you make of these negative interest rates globally? And do you, uh, do you think that you know Indian interest rates are too high and they may actually come down um, in future? And what, what? As far as Indian interest rates are concerned, uh, when you see the domestically, it is driven by the inflation. And uh, when the inflation is so high compared to the global scenario, the interest rate cannot be uh, cannot come down to the level that we cannot even think about the negative interest rate scenario in India. When you are saying that my inflation in the longer term uh, going to be around 4% and you want to keep a positive real interest rate uh, by 1%, so your, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rate will, be, uh, will materialize at least at the 5 to 6% level if the uh, medium term target of the 4% materializes. So I don't think that right now, yes, the 8% uh, the kind of a, uh, the 772, 7, 780 kind of interest rate scenario can come down, but not the, it cannot be compared with uh, global scenario and it is, uh, that's why it is affecting the, uh, it is attracting the global flow towards India, why they want, they, they can borrow in their country and uh, there is a lot of global liquidity and they can borrow in their country at a lower rate and invest in India and like the, uh, given the currency rates and all that, they can still make a 3-4% return. So, in India, uh, I think the uh, inflation being the anchor, uh, I don't uh, think that we will be having like a financial scenario. Thanks, Jana. Let me turn it over to, uh, to Ikram. Uh, now, we have these new challenges in market risk. For instance, you know, normal interest rates, as an example, you know, are negative and, you know, banks are finding it difficult to model them. All your sample models go for a toss. <laughs> for that matter, all your log novel models go for a toss. You know, you just interest rates, normal interest rates being negative was, was, you know, unheard of and unprecedented in some sense. So, what are the challenges that you find now in terms of modeling uh, some of these risks? And secondly, uh, what kind of skill sets do you look for, you know, um, when you hire somebody for market risk these days compared to, because you have to do a lot of fundamental thinking now compared to, you know, what was uh, maybe five years back. A lot of things have changed yet. I think it's it's basically a, a problem we face in bank from last three or four years across the you know, I've seen in both the banks I think but uh, across all the global banking is facing it. Uh, I think sovereign board model goes for a toss but uh, we are moving away from log normality condition in a lot of cases. You know most of the banks are actually moving away from log normality because it assumes that it cannot go below zero. Okay, basically the number. So now we are moving away towards you know normality, which can also go to uh, a negative number. So most of the banks are moving to that, and then they first they recalibrate their, you know, I would say the time series, and then they convert into a number which will look like okay, if it's a fair, then I will use some, some of the you know Sauber models or those models. So basically, at data level, I'm just making some adjustments and changes. Okay, that's being challenged by a lot of regulators. Okay, but I think that's. Uh, that's the uh, that's an acceptable uh, in terms of yes because there is no other way you, because you need to really change your whole infrastructure the way it has been set up because as I uh, earlier also mentioned uh, bank says you know it has to uh, like regulators say it has to be front to back you cannot manually intervene and adjust the numbers if at all you are saying you are using this model you have to use it and then that do the adjustments at the end so eventually those are the areas which most of the banks foreign banks are doing. Okay, across uh, the street. Uh, in terms of really hiring, it is all about. Uh, I would say that you know people not only thinking about models per se, 
because I understand, you know, if you go to, I think he's a Capnisha, so, you know, he knows that we train a lot of modeling techniques to them, okay, this is a live bomb model, this is a hardware model, and this is various things, and it all works on certain assumptions. Basically, those, all assumptions are failing today, you know, a lot of things are really, those assumptions were even, earlier were not very true, but even today those assumptions get challenged by regulators. How do you prove that these assumptions are true? So basically you need to do you know, various techniques like a back testing or prove it. And, and that means that you eventually will need to be more like a solution provider uh, when you hire a market risk guy. It's not about, okay, you know all the modeling techniques, you have an amazing mathematics background. No, I think it's more about how you can put that into application and really use that application to really give a solution which you can also uh, basically validate uh, from a backtesting perspective. Okay. So I think I would say a, a pure a quant job which used to be there earlier in the modeling, it has really moving towards, uh, okay, can he manage the challenges if it all, some of the assumptions go for a toss? How really you're going to you know, work on it? How are you going to resolve those things? And we face it on the day-to-day -day basis, basically. Thanks, Ikhara. I think uh, Samuk mentioned uh, in the previous panel that uh, he, and he gave this example of Sherlock Holmes um, and, uh, and and Dr. Watson. Uh, let me just uh, so so you know if you if you if you need a very good market risk manager that holds good probably more true for market risk than 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 even for credit risk. Uh, if you want a very good market risk manager, you perhaps need somebody who understands how 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 a trader thinks. Because if you look at any of the market risk debacles and you know, uh, the next panel is going to be on, on operational risk, so let me just kind of you know, link it to that. Uh, if you look at any of the market risk debacles, be it the Societe General, Jerome Kevin, then, you know, you actually find that the, 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 normally what you find is that the trader is somebody who has been a market risk manager or, or has been in compliance. So he kind of knows, you know, where to basically cut corners and, and, and essentially uh, take more risk than perhaps he should. Uh, so, 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 so probably you know, just to add to Vikram, probably you know, you, you need people who have maybe maybe market risk managers. You need people who have been traders before, perhaps I don't know. Um, Which is very true. I think we all banks are doing that now. But there is another thing in terms of I, I would add to it that really uh, it's all about having your infrastructure ready, where uh, you you know how the trader thinks but also infrastructure to be very robust where you can capture, which is like an operation risk as well, but it also becomes the part of market risk where how you will capture some of the information which get, you know, miscued, like, you know, why LIBOR was fixed, basically it was all about, you know, somebody, it was getting up, it was uh, priced more than what it should be, okay? So eventually that control has to be there, that system has to be in place. So somewhere market risk is today not only about you know, the people, but also about the systems. And there is a lot of investment for most of the banks and really moving towards that strategic architecture where it becomes true front to back. And then through that front to back, basically use that data analysis and really uh, are able to uh, basically, uh, you know, analyze and see whether, okay, there's integrity there or not. Yeah, thanks, Vikram. Uh, let me turn to Navneet and, and get your thoughts on, so in the last one year especially, you've seen that commodity prices have changed significantly, I mean, be it oil, be it gold, um, especially oil for instance, you know, Black Friday prices fell by about $10, which is, again, hasn't happened, uh, you know, at least in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, so, why do you think, I mean, you find, you know, is it, is it the liquidity that's, that's, that's come into the markets and, you know, of course, a lot of commodity risk is actually going into markets and you find equity markets, especially commodity companies in countries like, you know, South Africa, which is essentially a commodity, uh, almost everything is basically uh, heavy, you know, basically uh, metals driven. Uh, so, how much of these commodity market fluctuations you find in the equity markets getting transmitted to uh, so the reason behind is, is like twofold. I think probably one is the demand destruction, uh, mainly driven by the China, where I think they were guzzling almost I think 50 percent increment in copper supply, zinc supply, aluminium, iron ore, thermal coal, rubber, sugar, cotton, 
I mean, you will just name it. Every, every single company that they were reporting with the slowdown. And also in the rest of the world. And then also, I, I think several other, so in, particularly in the field of energy, I think it's apart, apart from the demand destruction, this whole shale gas revolution and the focus on, on the renewables in almost every country. And I think OPEC was sensible enough to probably ensure that instead of cutting the supply, allow the price to fall. Otherwise, maybe you would be staring at a situation in 10 years, the world wouldn't be fossil fuel under the kind of investment that was going into the uh, renewables and, 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 and shale. But the way it's impacting, I think from a macro perspective, it's a great news for us and then probably the all the uh, uh, commodity users are a big beneficiary. If you look at the result season this quarter, and you can see some signs of the commodity users, their margins are, are expanding big time actually. Several companies, and then the consumer who use the active commodities, you look at several companies that are using petrochemicals, chemicals, metals. Uh, again, to give a, give a simple uh, example, of, if you look at the earnings, I think everybody talks about the big, uh, you know, the, the decline in the corporate profitability in India. A very large chunk of that actually is, is because of the commodity companies. If you take out the, uh, you know, impact of most of the global cyclicals, particular commodity companies in Sensex or Nifty, then the earnings go to that bad. And I think that's true. So it's reflecting in all the commodity countries, so Russia, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, look at their currencies, equity markets, I think it's, it's clear in the, the spreads, it's clearly reflecting that the fall in commodity prices is impacting them and badly. The one aspect that probably, I think it should keep in mind, of course, is in the last 30 years, I think probably we are living in the most peaceful time ever in, in human history, and humanity has never been, has never lived so peacefully the way we are living today, and, and I just hope that it continues, at least in my lifetime. Uh, but I, I think we need to keep in mind if oil stays substantially below these levels, then I think we look at the regimes that produce uh, oil, so right from your Russia, Venezuela, Nigeria, Sudan, Libya, Iran, Iraq, and I get a little scared. I think that's one risk that should be there in your subconscious, but it's, it's a great news for us, oil is staying below 50, but you need to keep in mind that I think that these are difficult regimes and I just hope that it doesn't really, I mean some of these countries, Yemen and all, I think they have the most youngest population on earth, they are they're far more younger than us and I, I, I think if, if people don't have enough to eat then, then there could be problems and these are like really regimes where you need to be worried about. So, all of us are celebrating the commodity price fall. Markets are doing very well. It's a great news for us, but I, I think that's one of the companies to keep in mind. It wasn't the case when prices were, you know, oil was was at 90. You know, there's a lot of value transfer that was happening from countries like India to. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe there was. I, I think the turn of tables in the commodity market will have very significant implications in the world in terms of the whole geopolitics, in terms of the economic effect, in terms of the whole. Money. So all these guys who are getting a look at the reserve accretion of all these oil exporters, trillions of dollars move from users like us to those people they were buying because they, their reserves were increasing and then obviously they were putting in certain assets. And I, I, I think longer term the implications are underestimated at this point in time, the whole turn of tables in the commodities market. So the last, if you believe that the commodity super cycle is over, the last 15 years and the next 15 years could be actually a mirror image of what really happened the last 15 years. I really hope so. Um, uh, Jaina, uh, your thoughts on this? I mean, we have this new, not exactly a new development, but a new development in the Indian context. But you find a lot of firms now trading algorithmically. Right? Um, and then you also have exchanges now competing in terms of response time. For instance, if NSE, the response time is in milliseconds. Now you have BSE, which is basically claiming that you know we respond, the response time is in microseconds. Okay, and there's this debate about, especially in the SEC in the US, that you know how much of these the algo traders actually provide liquidity. And there was some question about about liquidity in the earlier panel. So your thoughts on you know how much of the you know algorithmic trading or quant trading, how much of that is actually contributing to risk, and how much is the real value added in terms of liquidity? See, uh, sorry, I cannot answer this question because uh, I manage the exit from portfolio of the NSC and uh, this elbow side and all, I'm not allowed to speak, so sorry. Can I? Yeah, I'm going to give you views on this because uh, you keep hearing, I mean, as if they, they are the devils and 
you know, they, they, they're asking all the other investors and people who are recalled and they are making so much of money. I'm not, I mean, this is, so the truth lies somewhere in between. So, in 1987, a great crash happened. I think we haven't seen that kind of crash later. That time there was no value trading, right? No, and there was, there was. That time the blame was on portfolio insurance. Yeah. And then we send this flash crash and then whether in US treasuries or, or, or in the uh, markets. I mean, the, the, Declining liquidity is another reason why there is a lot of blame on the algo traders. But remember one thing that these guys, what they are doing is basically they are killing the margins of those people who were the market makers earlier, right? So these machines have replaced those people who were giving those two-way courses and making fat margins. I'm told that there used to be like several, some of these listed guys and they used to trade at a very high P ratio because people believe there is structurally so much of money to be made by giving the bid offer, uh, you know, <coughs> the spread in, in these markets, which these guys have filled. The other thing that these guys have, have done, I think, structurally is that the, most of the traditional charting techniques, they are make, people follow the traditional charting techniques, they are making them obsolete. So if you know the typical, you know, 200 DMA process or the resistance and the, I mean, different kinds of trend lines and all, and they have mastered a skill that, you know, take it to cross the 200 DMA, they know that a lot of people are going to follow because they believe that once something crosses 200 DMA or the 50 DMA versus the MACD or whatever, and then they know that a lot of people are going to follow, you do that trade, push it a little higher, a lot of people will come and then you know that it's not going to succeed because you only push it up or you only push it down. So I, I think the whole... Whatever you have, you have read in the technical analysis of last several years, I, I think they have made it like very, very tough for those people. But I, I, I think the, the markets evolve over a period of time. So the typical people who used to give two-way course, I think they made a lot of money over a period of time. Maybe there is this, all these renaissance, some of these funds, structurally they make so much of money. So, But I, I think over a period of time, markets evolve and they are just providing little more liquidity to the market. It increases the momentum and probably the second derivative, the momentum of the momentum also, but it's still, I, I think it's okay, it's not bad, that's my view. Yeah, perhaps, you know, you'll have a new set of technical analysis in charts, um, you know, after this advent of, of, of algo trading in India. Uh, because some, yeah, as you mentioned, clearly mentioned, some of those some of those charting techniques are clearly obsolete and do not work in at the microsecond level, even at the minute level, I mean. Uh, so let me just, you know, open the discussion for the panel, any last thoughts on, before we open it, how we can make for questions uh, to the rest of the audience, any last thoughts on, you know, on market risk in general? I think uh, what I would say in terms of market risk is, uh, I think way to 2000, I think in the Basel 1 and Basel 2, changed a lot of things with respect to credit risk. Eventually 2007 and, you know, the subsequent crisis have changed a lot of things into market risk. Really, it really moved into uh, where people believed that uh, you know if you have certain war models that will work very good, and you have some two or three techniques. You know, market risk a small part of it. It doesn't. Uh, it will work well. You don't have to worry because credit is the credit risk is the most biggest part of your risk. It is still today, but in terms of eventually what we have observed, especially the banks like investment banks and they, which they they have driven more in terms of the. Uh, rather than realized PNL is is basically uh, so what is your notional PNLs you know which they actually calculate on day to day basis which was not a credit risk but which came out of market risk which really made the losses and which really made the 2008 crisis as you mentioned the subprime it was obviously subprime market was there one trillion dollar but it was all synthetic and that's why there was no physical assets to exchange and the market value fell. Okay, so I think that, that really changed the paradigm, and today we have we are introducing more and more uh, techniques really to look in a one uh, in a one very wholesale view. We are not looking bar in a very isolation. We are doing bar stress testing from a credit risk perspective. We are adding EPEs, PFEs. We are adding that aspect to it, and also like risk appetite, you know, forward-looking things. So it's really changing the way. Uh, what used to be market is like you know more like a backward looking and you know you just have a view of one uh, one month and you should be good to a level where even market risk you have to have a much long longer view in terms of what you want to do it's it's all about liquidity what kind of assets you are investing and there's a lot of focus from regulators in terms of you know what where you are putting uh, your asset where you are investing 
uh, and and basically uh, producing uh, market risk for the you know for, for the bank per se, and also for the you know eventually the uh, larger one because they had uh, they had to really quantitative easing and that has really changed the whole paradigm. So I think it's a very uh, I would say a uh, lot of uh, you know data analytics and modeling, but a lot of human intervention which would also require in market risk. And you will see this dynamism really continuing. And it will come to the same part probably what, what we are at with the credit risk where you will find a lot bigger credit risk teams vis-a-vis -vis market risk team. But I think with the people, I think market risk teams are growing uh, exponentially in the last couple of two or three years, what I have observed. It's also considered a very safe job in these days. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Jenna, last thoughts on it. What we really think about the market risk, so in my opinion, what I understand is there is the price risk that we are taking on our portfolio and price risk that is quantified in terms of the interest rate risk that is coming and how we mitigate and what we do to mitigate that and what uh, the, the strategy that we do is it is inbuilt into the asset allocation that we do by limiting the exposures and by limiting the uh, credit risk that we can take. Market risk includes for us the credit risk also. So by restricting the certain uh, credit exposure, we mitigate that risk. So when we as a treasury people are source of the market risk, we are also responsible for mitigating that by doing the asset allocation in such a manner that the uh, the concentration risk as well as the interest rate risk as well as the credit risk is contained. So far, long only relative return investors for us, the whole concept of market risk is quite different than let's say uh, for a Deutsche Bank where because you have a leverage, so we don't leverage, we don't do shorting, so no no risk of short squeeze, we don't, we hardly use derivatives, so we are a long one. So from, from that perspective, the risk for us, let's say talking about the equity market, the risk for us is, is not able to deliver returns in line with the risk return profile of the of the fund. So if I'm running a beta fund, if I'm running an index fund, then how do I keep the tracking error at the lowest possible level? I mean, how do I reduce the impact cost at fall and product where I'm generate I'm, I'm expected to generate alpha there, then how do I ensure that I outperform the relative benchmark? And very simply, so let's say in case of uh, equity, there are various ways for an equity fund manager to do market timing, you do sector allocation, you do stock selection, then you decide which is the way you want to generate that first so that you don't mm -hmm. underperform how much you deviate from the uh, benchmark. So for, for us, the whole concept of market risk is very different. So we don't do any value at risk or a PBO1 for our bond portfolios, but we basically look at the attribution analysis. Of course, we do a little bit of, let's say, a, a stress scenario because the Link aspect, in fact, one of the uh, questions for the previous panel was on the liquidity risk and the gentleman said that you asked the same question to the next panel. But that, that's very, very critical, I think, anybody who's looking at the market risk because I'll just give this example. If you look at the S&P chart, uh, SPX on Bloomberg, and then look at the price volume chart and look at the way market has gone up and look at the way volumes have gone down, it's completely, absolutely a divergent trend over the last couple of years. So. The whole intended objective of the Volcker rule and the Dot Frank and several other things over the last couple of years to make markets safer and take away the risk that you know the the landings from 2008 are actually making the markets a lot more illiquid. The flash crash that happened in U.S. Treasuries, I, I think, should be a warning sign to the regulators globally. And the way size of the funds have increased on one side, you have billions of dollars in a Vanguard or BlackRock or a Pinko fund. On the other side, markets have become so illiquid because the, all the traders of, of the world, I mean, you, you can throw that line, traders of the world have, have shunned the, their trading book. So essentially, you, are, you have a scenario where, God forbid, if you have something like 2008, I would surely be hugely worried about the liquidity risk globally across all asset classes. And I think even in India, there, there is very little liquidity in the whole corporate bond market and the way size is increasing. That's something that probably we need to keep in mind because structurally we always, I think, probably underestimate the uh, liquidity risk. I, I remember he was mentioning that uh, it, whether it's good to hire a trader as a as a risk manager, right? And actually, not by conviction, but even by compulsion, because you look at the globally, all the banks, every bank is cutting the headcount, and where the X is falling is the traders, relationship managers, and national bankers, originators. And thanks to all the, the Walker rule and Dodd-Frank and the 
number of pages that have been you know added by every regulator in last five years. The only department where you are increasing people are the other risk and compliance and review. So, <laughs> these guys are great business. <laughs> True. Um, in fact, as you rightly said, the largest liquidity providers are the Pipcos of the world, not the Goldman Sachs or the Morgan Stanley's anymore. Yeah, which is quite risky. So let me open the house for questions. Please feel free. Um, yeah, please introduce yourself and um, anything related to market risk, liquidity risk. This question is for Navi. Uh, you spoke about uh, liquidity and uh, and have you know, the, the fact that the comparison of you know the volumes are dropping and the the um, and, and the consequence of that. My question to you is uh, how does funds now you know find out avenues to invest, uh, especially given that you know there's so much of liquidity but there's less amount of uh, uh, you know, investment opportunities and still take care of the returns which the investors are expecting. So that actually could be a structural source of alpha for someone if you, you use it uh, efficiently. Uh, just to give an example, why do you make more money by going down the cap curve, I mean you buy and within small caps because the liquidity is low and that's why a large number of investors don't look at an entire space and that's why so I have a time arbitrage and I have a research arbitrage because my time horizon is longer I'm less worried about the liquidity in the short run so all the traders are not there in that space then there is a research advantage because there is less liquidity because lots of institutional investors who look at a liquidity in a certain framework they are not looking at that space so that space becomes open for me who has got that longer time horizon who's got the research ability so I have an information and an analytical edge then I can play that to my advantage and can structurally generate alpha. So as, as an asset manager, so while I, I have a relative return philosophy for large caps where the research arbitrage is very limited and we look at how do I outperform the benchmark for the next two or three years, but I can actually play a more absolute return philosophy where I take a little longer period and get less worried about the uh, uh, liquidity and that could actually be a structural source of alpha. Similarly in the bond market, because I think those bonds are not liquid, let's say corporate bonds are not liquid, there could be a risk premium for you. And if you ensure that your liability side is well managed, you don't have concentrated liability side where a lot of investors can come for redemption and then you, you really have a problem. If you manage that well, I, I think there could be a structural source of uh, In fact, there is a recent paper, I don't know by if you are or someone that, if you divide almost every single market in the world, equity market, and split that into you know the most liquid and the most illiquid stocks. Most illiquid stocks actually structurally generate alpha, which is like quite uh, people would think very differently because in a typical risk management, that's why I put it Mr. Eskimitra when well, analysts predict God laughs. So he would say that this is like we're taking too much of risk, but actually that could be a source of alpha. And could be a reason that because the, the stocks that are very liquid, the your you know, analytical arbitrage is very limited and you make a lot more money because a lot of investors are not playing that market. My name is Rohit and uh, my question is more directed towards Vikram. Uh, Vikram, uh, when we talk about market risk, the, uh, uh, the latest thing that comes to my mind is uh, the Greek exit. Uh, and uh, obviously, the Ultraman may uh, could have been the most effective. So I just wanted to know what was the thought process like uh, at the backdrop of uh, Greek exit uh, in case it would have happened and how are we looking globally now uh, after the Greek exit is stopped? Per se, uh, what we thought about the uh, Greek exit, but I think in terms of, as far as the markets were concerned, you know, they already priced it in terms of, you know, Euro and other currencies. So, you know, in terms of when even this conversation of the Greek exit was happening, you know, I would say the, the Swiss fall 
was more impacted all the banking sector which will basically when they change the pegging around you know maybe around last year that impacted more rather than you know in the pre exit would have happened it would have been more the longer term in terms of probably you know what would happen if at all not the greek but if some of, some of the other good economies actually you know if they exit the euro that means euro will go for a loss i think that would have been the problem it would not have been the immediate one but as far as the immediately what we were looking through the portfolio we already priced in terms of most of the banks has actually accepted you know greek may exit and eventually that's why there's a lot of push that you know we give them in you know, uh, you know uh, the quantitative easing or some of the loans and they agree on the terms to really stay within the euro okay hi sorry i'm sanjeev miranda i had a question uh, to all on the panel in terms of the structured products we spoke about the otc market over the next 10 to 15 years do you see an increase in the uptake of structured products being traded by uh, the retail population because i guess the last time the retail population loved a structured product all of them lost money especially of 2008 crisis so do you see in the next 10 to 15 years because we're going to have a housing boom here and uh, 2020 if india has a crisis you want to hear first uh, no this that it's a lot of you know second order risks packaged in such a way that the bank makes money okay so any view that you have on the structured products be it a callable range accrual note or a target redemption note or a snowball any of those fancy structures you could actually you know uh, execute that so long as you as you know what 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 the view is in a more simplistic way so traditionally you know we've had structured two ways of structured products really one in the 1990s you had orange county getting blown up and a lot of people lost money and then you had uh, in 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 a low yield environment around 2002 2003 uh, when the fed cut interest rates and people were looking for yield enhancements uh, i personally don't think that even you know even though you know I'll, that you know i don't personally don't think that structured products will take off in a very big way because if you look at derivatives market per se that's come down from around 790 trillion dollars in terms of notionals to about 600 trillion dollars so you know you see a clear trend there that being said uh, the, as I, as i mentioned earlier there is clearly a lot of offtake of quantos you know quantos are the new flavor now especially quantoed into currencies which are you know high yielding but i don't see i don't the party is long over i don't think you know the structured products will you know you would see that market taking off in such a in such a big way and that might hold good for the entire derivatives market i mean you won't see the second generation third generation derivative products taking off in a very big way that's my humble two cents yes who were offering the structured products basically the banks and you know that's what they were offering it and uh, really the frtb penalizes if you are actually dealing in structured products because you cannot value it properly so what happens is uh, you will they will put you on a standardized approach where you will be actually you know they will be charging 300 400% of you know rrb and and if you are charging that way you know why structured product made money was obviously because you know we always said you know it is very easily that uh, you can value it and you know valuations was easier and at that time nobody was really looking at it but today uh here the regulators really penalize that in terms of any exotic products which you cannot price and as far as if, if there is no robust uh you know pricing mechanism uh you know really your return on that capital really goes uh, goes for a toss because eventually even retail investors will buy only if they see the returns and there is another aspect to it which is not so much about uh, i would say market risk also about suitability you know it's all about that we need to show when anybody is selling the structured products i think that was you know you must have seen a lot of litigation in 2007 <coughs> in terms of you know banks have sold the structured products and you know they're still running go okay you know this was wrong you didn't tell me there was a downside like this and everything so there is a lot of suitability requirement which is required which as a market risk managers you need to sign off as well and the clients <coughs> needs to also see those products okay whether it does really does have suitability in terms of really selling those products so basically retail getting involved into that is absolutely no way <coughs> to allow that because it's really really very complicated and eventually the suitability would uh, it will it will lead to a lot of litigation and uh, no bank want to increase their legal cost as of now i think <laughs> 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 
couple of points. I mean, structured products are a very good example of you know what's aging global banks. You know, um, so one. The profitability has come down. So, you know, the kind of products that you could sell 10 years back in 2005 and 2006, that clearly is not happening. That's true for a Deutsche Bank or a City or a Morgan Stanley. The other thing that's happened is that when you have a complicated product like structured products in your in your, in your your balance sheet, it could be funded, unfunded, the, cost, the capital increases tremendously. You have capital for market risk, okay? You also have capital for credit risk through market risk if it's unfunded. Okay, so if it's a if it's a Deutsche Bank doing a back to back swap with somebody, then you basically have to allocate you know capital for for the CDA as well. Okay, so the capital requirement has increased tremendously. The profitability is not there. So banks wouldn't find it you know unless the margins are really very high. I don't think banks would be too gung ho on recruiting traders who can who can who can do structured products. I mean, even from banks' perspective. And that uh, you know the bank is moving from. Uh, no, um, Monte Carlo to historical war. Now, I mean, given the fact that you know we're changing the way uh, the tradings are done, there are a lot of regulatory, regulatory stuff which is coming up. I feel that maybe historical return might not make sense to you know kind of forecast the uh, the future war or you know P and L. So, why why do you think like uh, historical will make more sense than Mont Monte Carlo still? happens is that you basically model all the correlations and stuff, okay? Now, the reason why the, the Fed says that and the ECB says that you need to do it in the historical simulation approach, or at least they recommend that, is because all your, you know, all the correlations, all the, you know, the changes in volatility, heteroscedasticity, all of that is built in, in the data. So historical simulation is you just look back and essentially revalue your portfolio and see how bad could the losses be and then you quantify your value at risk at whatever confidence level. So the comfort level for the regulator is a lot more uh, with historical simulation because it's not really fancy valuation. All you're doing is MTM, you know, doing MTM of your portfolio uh, going back in time. Whereas in Monte Carlo, you have this Jolisky decomposition where you basically more, you know, cognize for all the possible correlations. If you have, let's say, 1,000 asset classes, then you're talking over 100 C2, about you know, 10,000 or perhaps more correlations and so on. So Monte Carlo clearly has its own set of challenges. And almost all banks, you know, I was surprised when Vikram told me that Deutsche Bank is in the process of moving from Monte Carlo to historical because a lot of American banks clearly moved about, about seven, eight years back. So historical simulation going forward, the, the, the regulator uh, is a lot more comfortable. And if you look at the tone of regulators in terms of market risk, you know, if you look at the SR 117 guidelines on model risk, the regulator seems to be saying that I'm not so confident about models. Okay, so that's that's a larger message the regulator seems to be conveying in terms of market risk. So they probably stick to historical simulation, which is a lot simpler than Monte Carlo. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Before we begin the next one.